without further ado, I will like to introduce our guest speaker for today. We have Dr. Elizabeth Crouch joining us um, from her lovely room there. <laughs> Y'all can see our guest bedroom right now. Perfect. Um, Dr. Crouch is an assistant professor in our health services policy and management department. She also has a uh, leadership position with our Rural Health and Minority Research Center as deputy director. And she's going to be talking to us today about unaddressed disparities around rural minority populations. Um, she has um, quite the background in policy and economics and statistics. And I hope at some point, maybe we'll even get your take on what's happening now um, with the pandemic and maybe um, some things that Rural Health Center is, you know, is kind of hearing about what's happening in terms of the impact on our um, minority and rural populations. All right, so without further ado, take it away, Dr. Crouch. Would be happy to. Let me share. Um, can I share my screen? Is that what's yep, going on? Let me. Um... Okay. And can you all see the full presentation? See, you can see my full screen? Yes. I gave a talk um, last week, and people could only see like a very small portion of it. And I was like, oh, no. So this is good. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you so much from ha for having me. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our center. This was started um, by Dr. Um, Jan Probst about well exactly 20 years ago. Our first funded year was in year 2000. Um, Dr. Probst, I really want to give a shout out to you as a mentor and one of the first people in the country to look at the intersection between race and residence. So previously, before publications started coming out in the late 90s and early 2000s from her team and some teams that she helped inspire, like Dr. Glover, for example, um, was doing his research with her. Dr. Glover is also an emeritus professor who I adore um, from our department. They were kind of, her and Dr. Glover were kind of the front runners of this because people used to think, okay, well, the minority experience is the same wherever you live in rural America. So we think there's a difference between um, we think there's no difference between rural, not just rural America, but in America in general. So we think that African Americans are having the same experience in urban areas as far as health conditions as well as they are in rural areas, or Hispanics are having the same condition in rural areas as urban areas, and that's just not true. So we're going to look at this, that they were the kind of the first to look at, okay, what's happening as you intersect race and residence together? And feel free to like, um, I don't know if I can see the chat box, but feel free, Dr. Ingram, to stop me if you see any questions people have along the way. So I'm happy to answer stuff and make this as interactive as possible. I think I can't see the chat box when I share my screen. So please just stop me and interrupt me. I would love to answer any questions you all have as we go along. So we'll do. A um, little more about the Rural Health Research Center. We're one of um, nine funded rural health research centers in the country. Um, some of those of where they are or have been located have changed over the last 20 years. We are very thankful to have been continuously funded since 2000. So our recompete went in in February. So this is an adapted talk I gave um, last, no, two years ago, the National Rural Health Association. This was a health for their health equity portion of their conference. Um, th some, so this is going to highlight some of my own research, some of um, our team's research. Um, and I'm going to introduce who from our team you've, um, you're reading about as we go along. So unaddressed, unaddressed disparities among rural minority populations. So I want to talk about first how we're going to approach this um, subjective. So I'm going to give some recent news articles and some books and some things that have been influential that you may have seen in the popular media about um, you know, what's going on in rural America. This came to the forefront at, with the um, presidential election four years ago. I think it'll happen again this next upcoming election year. And then the objectives, I'm going to show some of our research, um, and then the assessment on what this means, and then the plan going forward as to how to address these disparities. So hopefully this gives you all a framework as to which way we're going to go for this talk. So subjective. So some have said the world of in rural research is, you know, is the world is ending. So you may have seen some things about um, driving middle-aged white people's deaths of despair. So there was a lot in the news articles the last few years about deaths of despair, meaning that 
opioid overdoses were high in rural America. Um, suicide rates were extremely high in rural America. It was largely a white problem, but not in completely. And so that's kind of one of the misconceptions. People said, oh, this just addresses, this just affects poor white people in America, in rural America. And that's not necessarily the case, but that's how it was depicted in the media. So that's one of the first things you may have seen in the news. Um, articles, you know, American Journal of Public Health had a whole section on despair in the American heartland, a focus on rural health. Um, this book became very popular, J.D. Vance. I'm not a huge fan of this book because it creates a very negative view of rural America and says, as I'll get to the end when we talk about the assessment of this is just the way culture is, not necessarily the case. Other sociologists have come along and talked about rural America and, and the positive sides of rural America. And my research um, is in adverse childhood experiences, often in rural urban differences. And there's often some positives to this, such as, such as social capital um, that exists in rural America that aren't always discussed. So this one you may have seen. So that despair may be the diagnosis that you're seeing in, in the media, but um, this is not, we don't want to, we're not going to end on despair. We're going to talk about the positives, but there have been consistent disparities experienced by rural minority populations. And there's ways in which this is, it's important to illustrate this so that we know what policy recommendations and interventions are needed. So that's kind of where I hope you all see what the intervention inter section is of rural health and policy really occurs because um, one of the objectives of our research center is to kind of drill down some of these data, some of these research questions and make policy briefs that then go on to federal legislators so they can see, okay, here's what's happening in rural America and different parts of it. Here's this intersection where we're seeing disparities among rural minority populations. Now, what can we do about it? So not just having discourse within the academic world, but in the really within the policymakers and legislation, what can we do to address these disparities? And we can only address them if we know about them and can illuminate them and can illustrate them. So I don't want you all to come away from this presentation thinking, oh my gosh, everything's terrible in rural America. It's not, but we do want to address some of these things. So for example, the next slide. So cancer incidence in itself is generally lower in rural areas. You want to look at this? So um, can you see this part of the slide? I can, some of it's kind of, I'm going to move, so I can move, oh, here I can move the zoom um, things, people's faces around. So I can move, see my, my whole slide myself. Okay. So um, this is looking at incidence races from 2009 to 2013 by race. Um, again, you got the colors of small rural, small metro, and large rural. Let me go over that, what that means for a second. So there's gradations of rural. So sometimes in my slides, you'll see just a rural urban split. So, so there's, and I teach a rural health class, which I would love to have any of you all in um, every spring. And so um, there's about literally 9,000 ways to define rural. We go over about seven of them in my, my course. But one of them is you're looking at rural, urban, so met, usually metro, non-metro, that's kind of how you usually think about it. But there's also gradations of rural. So large metro would be like your city, um, like within this city limits of Columbia. Small metro would be, um, for example, the outskirts, maybe you live in um, Irmo, so you're on the suburbia part of, of of it. Um, large rural, so maybe you're in a larger small town, and then small rural thinking like you're way out in the hinterlands, for example. So you're further further out. So it's a gradation of rurality. So what you're seeing is, and you look at, for example, among um, black residents, and this is, this is nationally, by the way, um, you're seeing that metro have, has the highest incidence of cancer, and then it goes smaller as the levels of, of rurality go lower. So incidence may be lower, but it's not just important to look at incidence. It's also important, important to look at um, mortality. So what we're seeing in rural, and this is Dr. Eberth, um, Jane Eberth, who's in EpiBios. This is um, some work that's come out of our group. So she leads the kind of the cancer unit of our um, research center. I lead more of the maternal child health part of it. So one of the things they're looking at, okay, so incidents may be lower in rural, but that, but death rates are higher. So 
and especially among minorities. So if you look at them at the graph here, so among um, African American residents or Black residents, you see. So if you look at large rural rates are much higher than, for example, in mortality rates versus white. So if you were seeing me point the dark red, the garnet, versus of, of among black residents is much higher than among white residents. So, so we're incidents may be lower, but that but the reason that death is higher is because in rural America, um, residents are often getting diagnosed with cancer at later stages. So because there's less screening, less available to providers, going to be less prevention efforts. There's people getting diag um, the incidence is going to be overall maybe lower, but the uh, the time of diagnosis may be later, as well as availability providers to provide care. So your mortality may be higher in general. So looking at this, this is kind of a hard thing to look at unless you like look in close, which I'm doing right now. But um, this epidemic of despair is looking at, so for example, poisonings and suicide and other types of um, Look at the things we're looking at are salt, cancer, cardiovascular, HIV, liver disease, motor vehicle, poisoning, suicide, other causes. So poisonings and suicides, we're seeing um, at higher rates among younger people now. That's what's been the last, this is an article from 2017. So in the last few years, they're talking about suicide and overdoses going up, largely due, largely due to the opioid crisis, which has been a problem in rural America. I'm just skip over this for a second. Um, this is important because suicide rates have consistently been higher in rural. So um, there's been a lot of research come out of Washington State from WAMI, the Rural Health Research Center on Rural Suicide, as well as um, Minnesota. Carrie Henning Smith is talking a lot about suicide. It's not just drugs, a lot of it's firearms. Um, one of the policy concerns that I have personally is that until recently, there was not funding for firearms research, such a controversial issue that there was no funding for it. And so one of the um, greatest ways that people may die in rural America from suicide is through firearms. And those are more obviously prevalent in rural areas and um, they're also more deadly for suicide. So this is one of the, the issues that have been taken up in the last couple of years is I guess the last six months is when the CDC said, okay, we're, we're going to start funding firearm research. But some rural health researchers were looking at this regardless just because of um, we're seeing suicide rates consistently higher in rural. And if you look, um, it's, it's consistently higher among African Americans and Alaska Natives. So, if you look, so, it's, so the first slide, it looks at white and then black and then AIAN. AI is American Indian slash Alaska Native, which are often collapsed. We look at data and so um, and you get a publicly available data. So you're saying that American Indian Alaska Natives have the highest rates of suicide in um, among rural. So so you look compared to rural to non-rural. So American Indian Alaska Native have a higher rate of suicide across time in rural compared to their to, to their compared to their urban counterparts, which is the um, circles without in gray. Um, African American, Black, non-metro, metro, basically about the same, but white populations are having also having a higher rate of suicide compared to their urban counterparts. So, let me look at my notes for example. For example, um, so the rates groups with disparities. So residents of non-metropolitan areas are having higher rates of suicides than residents of metro areas for all racial ethnic groups. And with American Indian Alaska Natives, we're the only group higher the suicide than whites. And why is this important? Because suicide may be prevented when its warning signs are detected and treated. So um, one of the reasons it's important for research is to eliminate it is, okay, we can prevent this. So identification of suicidal ideas and plans among individuals who are perhaps being treated for depression, um, hopefully will increase with the use of electronic medical records, um, standardized screening treatments, et cetera. But some of this, these risk factors in rural um, may be obvious to you, maybe not so much. So um, there's less access to mental health care in rural areas. There's increased social isolation, and there's also increased opioid misuse. So these are some of the reasons you may see um, higher suicide rates 
um, among rural areas. So it's growing everywhere, um, but it's growing especially in rural areas. Okay, so death rates. So um, for American Indian, Alaska, Native African American white population, death rates increased with rurality. For Asian Pacific Islander and Hispanic populations, the pattern for um, the pattern is not clear. So let's look at overall death rates now. Okay, so age adjusted death rates. So American Indian, Alaska Native compared to white. So you see it is um, higher across all areas. And so it's, it's becoming higher as you go to um, more rural areas. So micropolitan means is getting, so it's, it's going from large metro, fringe metro, medium metro, small metro, micro. So it's going across the gradations to get to non-core, which is the rural. So among rural, you're seeing rural, so look at the very far right, you're, and then it says non-core, you're seeing rural African-American, I'm sorry, rural American Indian Alaska Native populations having a higher death rate than whites. This is the next slide you look at um, African Americans versus white. You are again seeing um, as the gradations of rural increase, you look at your very far right bars, non-core. So again, African Americans are having higher death rates than whites. And one of the, I'm gonna go back for a second. One of the issues with sometimes with studying um, minority populations is, especially if you look at use Medicare data is because of structural discrimination, as far as what's happened in our country the last 100 years and previously before being built for that, um, and, the, and the health disparities that are come with that structural discrimination, you may not even see people in the data set to a degree to study. So for example, often um, there's not as many African American people on Medicare because of the fact that a lot of them have, may have already died previously, especially in the rural South. So some of this is, may be underestimated, for example, based on data availability because people may have already passed away. This is all deaths, but if you're looking at just older people or using older data sets, it's often underestimated because the data is just not there because people have already passed away, but this is all deaths, so it creates a more clear view of what's really happening. Okay. Um, Asian Pacific Islander, again, this is, this is lower. It's kind of one, one of the minorities that where it flips. Okay. And then same thing with Hispanic. So, Afri so American Indian, Alaska Natives, and then um, African American residents, you're seeing higher rates of mortality um, in rural areas compared to the referent group, which is whites. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over this. Okay. So what's happening in rural? Why might these, why might there be higher um, death rates among minority populations compared to those two and what's happening in rural? Um, in general with deaths. So rural drug deaths are increasing. Um, again, this is looking at, this is a kind of older data, but this is, this is in 1999-2000. And then of where, of where, um, of where death rates were. And then if you go to the next slide, 2014, um, you'll see, you're seeing a lot in Appalachia. If you can see, let me, I wish I got like a pointer thing for this. I guess you, oh, you can see my, clicker thing, can't you? Good, okay, cool. So um, rather than me pointing my finger, which y'all can't see from this, I'm sorry, I'm not quite used to the online form yet, but I'm learning, Dr. Ingram, so bear with me. So if you see along where Appalachia is in the dark red, you're seeing higher rates of overdose. Overdose, opioids, for example, have hit, um, high, opioid death rates and opioid use has been very high in Appalachia, so you're seeing the evident with what's going on in the, um, really distinct red here. So high drug mortality in, in Appalachia. Okay. But this is not, so people just said, okay, well, this is a new phenomenon. This is happening, which has death, drugs, you know, deaths of despair that we had the recession in 08. We have this opioid issue. This isn't, this is a new problem, right? It's not a new problem. So Rural mortality disparities date back to the 1980s. So if you look at this graph, or you're looking at, you can, your reference group is rural U.S. white in the um, dark gray. If you compare this to um, urban U.S. white, which is here, you see that while, um, you, see, you see that 
rural U.S. white, the rural whites are having among all the people in the U.S. Are, are dying at greater rates than urban. And the same is true for rural African Americans versus urban African Americans. So rural black versus U.S. black it is still higher. So there's a, definitely a disparity at which rural people are dying at higher rates and younger than um, their urban counterparts. So the life expectancy is lower. Okay. So most analysis address race or residence, but they do so separately. So that's one of the um, issues. And one of the issues is, so for example, you look at Health US, this is a table from the National Health, Health Energy Survey. If you look at all this, one of the things is that um, most major documents focus on major populations. So they inc may include race or urbanization analysis but residence is often not available in publicly available data. So for example, um, stuff that I've published on, for example, with adverse childhood experiences, if you look like I use the, um, I'm gonna come in here for a second. The, oh, I just wrote my paper on this. National Survey of Children's Health, I blanked for a second. National Survey of Children's Health, this past year for 2017, 2018 data set, only had 34 states there was publicly available data on residents. So 16 states, they were worried about data, you know, private confidentiality issues. So they suppressed the residents data for 16 states. So there's often a problem unless you go to our research, research data center for the, the census, which is A, expensive and B, far away. There was one in Raleigh, there's one in Atlanta, there's one a bunch of the Northeast, but it still takes time away to go. Residence is the only cross tab that can't be performed using publicly used data. So that's often why this research is more limited. But there's just not the publicly available data to do so. I have made the argument for years. Well, if you want to see more research, and so Dr. Probst, um, Dr. Glover, if you want to see this research done, we've got to have availability of data. All right. 2017, we're calling the year of rural. We saw because of the election, maybe because of all the social media press, maybe. There was a huge emphasis, people that never did rural research started coming out with it. So the CDC had in 2017, 11 rural focused for um, MMWR surveillance summaries. They had 12 of you include an Iowa study. And eight out of 11 of those included some race, ethnicity, cross tab. So they're starting to look at, okay, what's happening between um, the intersection of rural rurality and race? One of the issues is the CDC though, out of these 11 reports, about nine of them had different, used different definitions of rural urban. So they were hard to compare. So one of the issues is if you're gonna have one entity using this data, using doing these analysis, which is great that they're getting started, we need some ability to compare. So we need some, some standardization of um, definitions. So that is a nice way of saying it. Some of my mentors and people in the rural health world are pretty angry about the CDC about this, but hey, at least we're having a positive spin. They're beginning to do this work, which is wonderful. Um, AHRQ put out a chart book on rural health care and the National Cancer Institute um, began a rural cancer control research emphasis. So as there's been more evidence that, okay, cancer mortality rates are higher in rural, what's happening? The National Cancer Institute has begun to really put some research emphasis on this. So um, we as a center receive funding from the National Cancer Institute. So our, from 27 and 2018 as well as 2019, we've received re money from them um, funneled through our FRHP, so Federal Office of Rural Health, Pol Health Policy um, funding line so that we are getting money to look at these disparities for cervical cancer and colorectal cancer among rural. So the first year we did a cervical and, and colorectal um, cancer scan to see what are the differences in South Carolina between rural or populations as far as access. Once, once you're diagnosed, diagnosis, preventative efforts. So can, it's harder to get a colonoscopy in rural America, for example, or rural South Carolina. You have to go to an urban area. So you might go to Col Columbia for your colonoscopy versus going in in Sumter, for example, or other places that are rural. So there has been some emphasis in recent years about this. All right, and this is increased attention. So again, the CDC reports, all of them had, um, not all of them, but several of them had different 
definitions of rural. So three metro, non-metro, three of them use four urban, two rural, some use non-core rural only. Again, there's a lot of different definitions of rural and it matters how you do it. Okay, so we were on time. I can kind of go off, we're, we're okay. Um, so 11 reports that had 16 different distinct classification approaches. All right, so what's this overall assessment? So there's some proximate causes of excess mortality. So poor health. So in rural areas, you often see people that are now um, talk about rural America being older, poorer, and sicker. So three things to remember, older, poorer, and sicker in general, because it's some demographic stuff going on. So people may, there's a lot of out-migration of younger people from rural areas because of the economic issues. There's an, not all, uh, let me back up again, again, since I'm trying to, condense my, like, I guess my course in, a, in one lecture, but rural does not look the same everywhere. So rural South Carolina does not look the same, for example, as rural Montana. So rural Montana, you may have a wealthier population than you would, so I'm comparing, like, say, let's say Big Sky Montana, which is a resort area of Montana. Very wealthy compared to, let's say, Bamberg, South Carolina, which may have the same population density, maybe much, much, much poorer. So the rural depends on where you look, but we're just giving some classifications of what look, rural looks like in general for this talk about what you're seeing overall nationally for prevalence. So in general, you're seeing poor health. Um, some of this may be due to adverse behavior patterns. So we wrote a book chapter last year that looked at, okay, what, so let's do a review of the literature. What are these adverse behavior patterns? So higher rates of smoking, um, substance misuse, um, less seatbelt wearing, and you're wearing your seatbelt less in um, windier roads with higher speed limits. You may have more traffic fatalities. Um, there's, you know, more use of heavy duty equipment, like farming equipment, for example, or more use of pesticides. Some of this may affect health conditions later on, as y'all can imagine. One of the big ones, though, you may have already heard about or realized is this lack of access to care. So, providers, having providers in rural areas and provider retention. So attraction and retention is, a, is an issue. My brother um, is a rural um, physician. He works in um, Pikeville, Kentucky, which we could, I might go back to all my slides to show a map of where Pikeville is, but you can do a quick Google, Google map thing and look at it. It's in Appalachia. Um, Pikeville is the regional medical center for Appalachia. So the small town he lives in in Pikeville actually has a lot of doctors. I've asked him to come talk to my rural health class before and he said, I don't feel comfortable doing so because he said in our area, we literally have every specialty because we're the medical center. But if you went an hour away, there's basically no healthcare provider. So, so, but this is a problem in general. So how do you get, how do you get doctors to stay? So in their town, for example, these young doctors come work. They have a loan repayment pro program with the um, federal government as well as the hospitals to get their loans repaid for medical school. And then a lot of them leave. So they may stay there five or six years and then leave. So one of the problems is having getting people, one of the constant conversations you have it among rural healthcare researchers as well as providers and practitioners and stakeholders is how do you keep providers in rural areas? Um, that's one of the issues, so lack of access to care. But the underlying causes of disparity would be poverty of education and resources. So, um, and again, this is going to look different based on where you are in rural America, as I just discussed about the Montana versus South Carolina example. But one of these things is educational attainment and resources. Okay. All right. So clear residence effects and, so if you look at this, this is the percentage of working ad adults delaying care, probably delaying care because they can't afford it. So if you look, this is a graph for white. So rural, small, so smaller areas of rural are delaying care at higher rates than, for example, urban large center or urban, urban median center. Um, you know, this is our referent. This is, and you're looking at, this is again, looking at, um, this side looking at black. So rural micropolitan, rural, small, again, delaying care at higher rates. There's two effects we want to demonstrate here. Not only does race matter, so there's some, again, I'm going to call it structural racism in the U.S. for race and for what people have access to. There's also residential issues. So um, 
And there's likely an interactive effect between race and resin, which is important. So one of the, I know this may be kind of a little bit discouraging to see what, what these drastic differences are among rural minorities, but it's important for policy recommendations. So quick comparative evidence that, sorry, I've got my little graphs, residence matters, okay? So if you look at self-reported variables, this is BRFAS. Um, you're looking at, this is again, this is non-core rural versus urban. Self-reported health, um, let's see, this is, oh, this is among African-Americans only. So, um, so delaying MDs, they're look more likely to delay. This is poor self-reported health, but more likely to report poor self-reported health. They are less likely to be insured. So rural is likely to be insured, less likely to receive age appropriate mammograms and more likely to be obese. So again, this is self-reported among African-Americans, Metro compared to non-core. So Metro versus, so basically Metro versus rural, Metro, not Metro, non-right Metro, higher reports of poor self-reported health, higher reports of delaying an MD due to cost, lower rates of insurance, lower rates of age appropriate mammograms, and um, higher rates of obesity. But there's also some benefit, there's also some good things. So they're more likely to, to benefit to have some of these good, what we call good behavior. Some of these were, um, so we'll get, this is, let me look at the graph. This is, okay, this is large metro. You can see the pinpoint. So large metro, large fringe metro, these are the points in which you're looking at these different things, other rural. So, um, some of these communities are more likely to have things like social capital, um, volunteering, going to their church. Some of these good kind of protective social behaviors were higher in rural areas. So modest tendency for them to be higher. But there is a clear interaction effect. This is my mentor's article, Probes at All in Health Affairs 2011. Presented here is the relative likelihood among persons who died of dying early, so before age 65. So as I was mentioning earlier in my talk, um, sometimes it's hard we look at these racial ethnic differences. For example, is um, minority populations may not, aren't making it, a lot of people aren't making it to 65. So you look at Medicare and you want to look at differences among Hispanic people or among African Americans. You can't as much because less people, less people are living till then. So there's less African Americans making it to 65 than white than white Americans. And so that's a problem when you want to use certain data sets to study this, study this issue. So I digress. This is looking at people who died early before age 65. People younger than 65 this is, are often in the workforce, typically still in the workforce. So their death is both an economic toll as well as a personal loss for the community. So um, this analysis adjusted for age to interview and for the sex. It compares the other populations to the risk of death among urban whites. So urban white is our reference group here. The gold, quote, the gold standard for most measures to roll with comparing what urban whites look like. It's based on national health interview surveys between 1986 and 2000 and examine the risk of death. And as you can see, rural African Americans are at a higher likelihood of dying before 65 than urban African Americans. So prior research that had shown that it didn't matter where African Americans lived, why they lived in rural urban, it was the same, was what the assumption was, that was not true. Um, rural African Americans are at a higher rate of death than, than um, urban African Americans, same for white. So white rural residents at a higher, at a higher rate than, um, than urban whites. However, you see that these rates are higher, so African Americans are more likely to pass away than their white counterparts. Again, I would argue this is some of the issues with structural racism we've seen in the US. All right, race, ethnicity with some resident effects. This is look, looked at who's getting their, their different kinds of, um, so who's getting the flu and who's getting pneumonia. So you might, so you're gonna see, so this is again, this is urban and then going into smaller areas of rural. So remote rural, slightly more likely to get the flu for white, the rural white, slightly more likely to get the flu than, than um, urban whites. This is not the case for African-Americans. Um, or not the case for um, for pneumonia for whites or blacks, black residents. Okay, 
Race has any resonant effects. Okay, overall, in 2014, the percentage of people who identified a hospital emergency or clinic as a source of ongoing care. So, do you want your hospital emergency room to be your source of ongoing care? No, Megan's shaking her head. Absolutely not. But for some people, it's going to have to be, right? Because they're not insured, they don't have access. So, groups with growing disparities. In 2014, so it was based, based on an analysis from 2014, the AHRQ Health Disparities Chart Book in 2017, um, the, the, people, the percentage of people who identified a hospital emergency or clinic as a source of ongoing care was higher for Blacks and Hispanics. So Blacks and Hispanics more likely to report this than whites in all residence locations. So in all residence locations, no matter where you live, Blacks and Hispanic residents are more likely to report this as their source of care, which is quite sad, okay? But then just look at, let's look at this by residents. So in 2014, more than half of Hispanics living in a non-core area, so in a rural area, and 36.9% of Hispanics living in a micropolitan area, so this is the non-core, this is the micropolitan, um, identified a hospital, emergency, or clinic, as a source of ongoing care, let's look at African Americans. As of 20 in 2014, 36.9% um, of Blacks living in non-core areas and 27.8% of Black residents living in micropolitan areas identified hospital emergency rooms or clinics as a source of, a source of ongoing care. And then whites had the lowest reported rates with 33.1% of non-core residents and 23.7% of micropolitan residents having the same identification. So you're seeing these disparities exist by rurality, right? Because we can see as you grow more rural, so this goes across the way, as you increase the level of rurality, we're seeing more people use these urgent services as, an, as a source of ongoing care, but you're seeing these disparities are higher among what? minority populations, right? So African Americans and Hispanics. So the intersection again between race and residence is key to examine. Sorry, I like the cup of tea, my glass of tea. All right, and I wanna skip over this. Okay, this was a 1999 county level mortality rates. If you look, you're seeing po high pockets of mortality again along with the Apple and Appalachia. We look a lot at the rural South. We're like the only, re we are the only re rural health research center in the South except for North Carolina, which is the Shep Center. So often our research focuses on the rural South. Um, this is the author's analysis is Crumhouse and all looking at people with Medicare. So, um, so um, where Medicare beneficiaries are dying. Again, what's the problem with Medicare data? you're missing some residents, you're missing some race ethnicity data, right? Because all of people may have passed away beforehand. Okay, so houses, houses changed over time. So in 2014, again, where are you seeing higher levels of mortality? It's even getting redder in um, rural areas. So again, I'm looking at this Appalachia. Okay, let's look at life expectancy in rural. Life expectancy at birth, um, 2014, Counties in South Dakota and North Dakota had the lowest life expectancy. So South Dakota, North Dakota. Look at these hot pockets of red. Hot pockets of red in Appalachia. The Mississippi Delta region, so this is. Again, hot pockets of red. Um, so South Dakota, counties in South Dakota, North Dakota, the lowest life expectancy. Counties in the lower half of the Mississippi Delta. Um, those in Eastern Kentucky, so rural, so I'm from Kentucky, so it's why y'all keep hearing me mention Kentucky. I'm from Louisville, which is a city in Kentucky, but my grandparents lived in Central Kentucky, and, um, and my papa was a veterinarian, so I know a little bit about rural from him, and growing up rural, because every summer there, so I have a, you hear me a lot about talk about Appalachian and Kentucky, is because I grew up there, and I'm interested in this area, and my family, obviously, I talked about my brother, who's in Pikeville, which is about here, so it's Pikeville's on the, um, Kentucky West Virginia board, the 30 minutes from, from West Virginia. So that's why you keep hearing me talk about this so much. Um, so Eastern Kentucky and Southeastern West Virginia, so right in here you see the red, had very low life expectancy compared with the rest of the country. If you look at people with purple, 
Colorado has um, some of the highest life expectancies in the country. So where you live matters as far as where, what your life expectancy is going to be. Dr. Ingram, what, how much time do I have? What time does your class end? 11.15, so. Oh, okay, I'm good. Okay. Yeah, so we got, we got. Okay, good, I always um, wonder, so I was like, I got a ways to go and I was like, I don't wanna be, um, <laughs> I can go on about this for a long time, but let me check yeah. real fast. Okay, well, good. Yeah, so, so we're at 1047, so if you want to go to 11, and then we can do questions. Perfect. Okay, I'll try to wrap up by 11, then. I was making okay. sure I wasn't going. I couldn't remember it ended right at 11 or not, so this is good. Yep. You're good. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. Let's look at infant mortality, guys. So rural counties have fewer deaths according attributed to low birth weight, and this is often because the pre-predominance of rural moms are white. So that's just um, one of the reasons why. But there's higher death rates for congenital malformations, SIDS, other intentional injuries. Some of this is some health literacy education, for example, for SIDS. And for post neonatal, so homicide, fifth of the top causes of death in the post neonatal period of the first year of life. So you're seeing um, fewer deaths to low birth weight, but there's some higher deaths for malformation, SIDS, and unintentional injuries, injuries in rural. All right. so. We kind of wrapped up some objective data. So kind of things I want you all to get out of this is that rural and, our, and rural minority health disparities are not new, are not new. We are hearing about them more recently. They are becoming more um, elucidated and, and talked about in the um, popular media, but these have been around for a long time, since the 1980s or before. They're just that they weren't, um, they did not make the forefront of the news until recently. So I think the opioid crisis kind of brought attention to some of this, but the opioid crisis, people in rural health research, honestly, they get sick of talking about the opioid crisis because we're like, the opioid crisis did not cause all of this. There were problems before the opioid crisis, just there was not enough research or enough attention illustrating some of these issues. So that's some objective data, through law data, y'all. So what are some of the underlying causes of mortality disparities? So what are some of the reasons why we might have these disparities in mortality? And I've talked about some of them as we've gone on, right? I've talked about poverty, but I'm gonna look at them in more detail as we go along in this next part of this presentation. So the rural Southeast, and again, that's our research focus area, but it's also where a lot of this is occurring, is marked by high poverty. So if you look along here, I keep looking at, so again, this is the gradation of purple is worse, right? It's purple high level poverty. So Appalachia, you see my South Carolina, the I-95 corridor pops out, right where you see that? You see the Mississippi Delta area. This is also some of the areas where, so for example, Georgia, um, let's see, Albany and Georgia is about here. You're seeing some of the areas where you're gonna see, some, you've seen some COVID-19 outbreaks. And there may be some reasons for that as well, which we can discuss as the class goes on. Child poverty. Kids are one of the things that I care about the most, my research is focused on in general. Um, child poverty also higher. Again, if you're looking at Appalachia, you see some pockets of red, red 50% or higher. You see some of that in North Carolina, South Carolina border. The Delta, we'll talk about some research from the Delta again for the selection ends. Um, and some of the parts of South Dakota, some of the tribal communities. One of the issues for studying child poverty or child health issues in the U.S., some of these national data sets, for example, I'm giving the National Survey of Children's Health another example of this, is because some of the rural um, data is suppressed in nationally available data sets, you are not able to look at some of the tribal communities. So, for example, um, I gave a talk at the National Advisory Committee on Health and Human Services last year, and we're looking at rural urban differences and adverse childhood experiences, so traumatic events in kids' lives. People said, well, why, are we, why haven't you talked about North and South Dakota at all or Arizona? Well, those states were suppressed because there's such few people are so rural, they're suppressing those, but then it also gets into how do you study this American Indian Alaska Native population if there's not data publicly available for it? So, that's like one of my, again, my digressions on data, avail data availability does matter for researchers, especially in areas where you might see higher rates of poverty, okay? 
Um, I keep talking about the structural, dis structural discrimination. One of the issues for this is segregated public schools. So this is, um, while segregation technically may not be legal anymore, it still happens. Um, sorry to tell you all, and very prevalent in some issue in areas. So this is from 2011-2012, um, so eight years ago. Um, and you're looking at um, as a percentage of, of share of, of African-American students attending majority non-white white schools. You're seeing, um, but basically you're seeing is you're seeing more segregation again in the South, which is not surprising. South, Texas, et cetera. Okay, same thing for Latino students. So, so educational attainment, um, you're not seeing is not they're having their fair share of getting a quality education because they're not there's so much segregation on what schools people are going to still and these educational disparities matter right so they affect health literacy so the ability to know what your kid needs so for example while i've been on um, the covid19 break as i call it not only really, it's not a break at all but while we've been home i've been working on a paper on rural urban differences in oral health care access with some friends and colleagues at nusc one of the things there is the health literacy of how do you know your kids need preventative dental care? How do you know your kids need fluoride varnish? Well, health literacy affects that. And if you have a lower educational attainment, so for example, this graph is looking at counties where 20% or more adults of working age, so 25 to 64, do not have a high school diploma. These are often higher in rural areas. So this is metro, again, non metro and metro. Look at the pockets of red, where do you see this? He's in Appalachia, parts of South Carolina, Delta, and parts of Texas, right? And so your kids, we're always talking about kids because legislators give money to kids. So not the only reason we talk about kids, but prevention matters. Prevention can lead to having to, to needing less interventions as people age. So we often focus on children for that reason. And what you're seeing is the health literacy. So this is one of the problems, one of the issues with people being able to. Um, take care of, take, can get their kids to preventative care in rural America is they may just not know the need for it and there's less access and it's costly so they may not be able to afford it. There's multiple facets of reasons but this is one of them is health, health literacy. Okay, one of the next things is restricted upward mobility. So this is from the source document. I'm just going to read this out loud to you all. This is looking at your ability for um, chance of reaching the top fifth starting from the bottom fifth, okay. Only 16% of children raised in poor areas become economically successful adults. Children who escape to neighborhoods with better schools, less crime, and more jobs by age 12 outperform siblings who were moved when they were older. And the effect is greater when a child moves at age six or younger. So um, moving to, with better schools, less crime, more jobs matters for overall education and attainment school age. A child growing up in a community with the lowest level of mobility can expect to earn up to 40% less during his or her lifetime than one who lives in a high mobility communities or neighborhood. So this is kind of getting some of those neighborhood effects of economic mobility and where you live it does matter, okay? Let's look at household debt. All right, any debt. So again, this is used some um, residents as well as um, minority, non-minority differences. So um, non-whites, minority populations more likely to have debt, household debt, especially medical debt, than, um, than white Americans. So share with, okay, that's, that's just the overall of any debt, 27% white, 45% non-white. Median medical debt in collections, Average is 720 for non-white and 650 for white, with an overall share of non-whites having about 21% in medical debt versus only 16% for whites. So health share without health insurance coverage. Let me give another example of that. Health insurance coverage. Those without health insurance coverage, overall, it's 9% of the population, 6% white, non-white, 14%. So there's this disparities in race as you go along. Let's go talk about household income. Household income, all the average household income across the country, 78,000 um, for whites, $85,121 versus non-whites, 
$63,787. So you see these, I mean, there's literally substantial, substantial differences in debt. I just remember that 16% white and health insurance. And health insurance, again, you're seeing a lot of these dark purple and um, dark, dark blue people that did not have health insurance. Um, this is in 2015. So for example, South Carolina, you can see us right here, um, right here, we're right here, right here's North, South Carolina to the border. Um, we did not expand Medicaid, right? And so some of this becomes issues for, let's talk about the COVID-19 thing for a second with health insurance. If you can't afford to get tested and you can't afford early treatment, you're going to have worse outcomes in rural areas, for, correct, for COVID. And there's, just, there's screening issues across the country. But one of the big things is, is lots of states in the rural South, not all, for example, Kentucky expanded Medicaid. They're doing pretty, they're doing pretty well now as far as for health insurance. South Carolina, others, South Carolina and Georgia, for example, did not. So we're likely to see worse incidences of and death rates and mortality associated with COVID-19 need you would see in areas where there are, there was Medicaid expansion and there is health care insurance. Another reason is because of rural hospitals. Since South Carolina did not expand Medicaid, we've had more rural hospitals closing than some of our comparative states. For example, I can give an example of Kentucky because where I'm from, I know a lot about it, where they did expand Medicaid. So higher rates of uninsured means people go to the hospital, people are still go, maybe going to the hospital in a rural area. They may go, they really need to, they're close to the brink of death or they have some major condition, but they can't afford to pay and so instead of, instead of Medicaid paying for those uninsured and helping people out, rural hospitals, which are off, often operating at a very low and like, you know, very tight profit margin, so they um, often can't deal with the economic repercussions of having more uninsured people come visit them. So that's going to be a problem nationally right now with the COVID-19 crisis is people going to rural residents, going to rural hospitals, may not be able to pay for services, also may be uninsured, and there's already economic stability issues for rural hospitals, right? So that's something I've not gone over yet. I'm kind of digressing because we're getting on health insurance, but that's one of the problems is lack of coverage in rural areas and lack of um, affordability in rural areas means that these hospitals that are already strapped or are up in the margin may collapse under this. As well, there's been stuff come out about how rural hospitals do not have the funds to equip themselves for both testing, screening, or um, protective gear for their hospitals or their hospital workers because they're already at the absolute fringe what they can do. Same thing for rural health clinics, same thing for um, just rural providers in general. So that's a digression off, off COVID-19. We can come more back to that in the discussion questions section, but that's one of the issues. Okay, so there's some uniquely rural barriers to why people may not be getting care. So distance, so it's hard to travel sometimes, especially for you heard about from a lot from maternal um, obstetric care, lack of those in lack of OBGYNs in rural areas. There's all, but there's lack of all kinds of providers from rural areas due to distance. So absence of providers, the providers aren't there, they're hard to travel to. Last is absence of privacy. You hear about this a lot with, um, for example, um, HIV AIDS or mental health or things that there may, people may have, there may be stigma around. People may not go to the local DHEC office, for example, because they're afraid of lack of privacy. Well, so-and-so knows my car and they can see my car whenever they go to, um, I go to get my drugs or go get screened for something, et cetera. All right, so shortage of healthcare providers. So you see the purple, purple, um, you see the, the, oh, sorry, non metro is the green. Um, so the HIPSA score means the healthcare, healthcare professional shortage areas. Can you see some of this and um, the green along the rural and Appalachia, the dark green, Mississippi Delta, part, and obviously parts out, parts out in the West. Minority relevant diseases. Look at some of the diseases that are more um, prevalent among minorities, diabetes, for example. Okay, here's some issues. Only 38% of rural counties have a diabetes self-management education program. So um, access to prevention and intervention efforts are a little more limited in rural for this disease. So rural counties with diabetes self-management program are often larger. 
They have a lower diabetes prevalence and are whiter. So what's happening overall, I'm just kind of skipping through this and I'm getting, I'm getting it's right at 11. I know you all time for questions is, high needs areas lack programs. Talking to how many areas lack programs. Ryan White providers looking at HIV, um, more limited in rural as well. Across the U.S., 31% of urban counties have a Ryan White provider for HIV. Only 5% of rural U.S. counties do. And rural residents do perceive these gaps. So how, do you think your community has enough doctors, for example, rural um, Answer percentage, you know, rural says higher than urban and among, and then again, among and have hospitals, same deal. So they, they realize they have less doctors, they don't have enough doctors, they don't have enough hospitals. Lack of providers. The flip side is everyone knows the name, which is great, creates some social capital, some protective issues. The flip side is it's difficult. Um, diagnosis are so stigmatized, care saving, care seeking is difficult. So um, if you're going to your doctor and getting care for HIV or mental health, they're what everyone's going to know. So they also have less resources. So poor education, so poor health literacy, so lower income, reduced ability to seek care, afford medications, and then fewer practitioners means you're getting um, more trouble getting into services, you're having crowded visiting schedules, there's little time for assessment or counseling. So assessment behavior. So is there a rural culture and how many cultures? Let's look at behaviors. That's good. So not very. So teen births. Teen births higher among minority populations in rural America. Smoking higher in rural America. So some of these behavioral things are also higher in rural. How can these disparities be addressed? This is kind of the crux of this whole talk today. How can we fix these disparities? Let's illuminate them. Let's illustrate them and let's work on helping these people, right? Let's help, let's, 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 one of the whole things this research is, what can you do that's gonna improve people's lives? Okay, so there's resource disparities versus cultural disparities. I do not want to confuse these. All right, at a minimum, there's some infrastructure issues. So critical access hospitals, those are getting a lot in the news right now with COVID-19. Um, how are you equipping these hospitals? That's another discussion we can get on to as we get to questions. Rural health clinics are there, federally qualified health clinics, other CMS and state rural funding programs. So what, I'm right now I'm running out of time, but these health centers and critical access hospitals, these are unique federal funding opportunities that may help reimbursement for providers in rural areas. So those are some of those issues. Okay, um, New York Hill Burton was the act that originally created a bunch of hospitals in the 1950s. So it's re-examining the concept of minimum necessary facilities. So we're starting to look at, okay, how do we fund healthcare and how do we deliver healthcare in rural areas? There's been a lot of talk about rural ICUs in this COVID-19 crisis. How do you use tele-ICU? So for example, our team working on paper right now, it looks at, okay, here's where COVID-19 is in rural areas so far. What's happening to tele-ICU? Because Journal of Rural Health is doing a big push in the next week to get some um, COVID-19 articles out. All right, beyond healthcare facilities, let's look at some bigger questions. The um, South Carolina Rural Health Action Plan is looking at, can we bring jobs to rural areas? Can we address broken school systems? Can we address gaps in low-income housing? Um, people are seeing the link between other symptoms and health. The social determinants of health, which I'm sure Dr. Ingram's talked about in this class, are finally starting to be addressed um, at, at local and state po and federal policy levels. Circling back, to culture. Some differences emerge. How people, for example, exercise. So high school ski team in Colorado versus maybe in other areas of high school rodeo team. Hunting, is it a sport or is it a version of farming? So there's taste-based preferences. To be culturally sensitive, we must listen and explore beliefs. But listening can be alarming. So in the South Carolina Health Action Plan, they listen to communities and they found um, deeply divided communities. So in South Carolina, for example, there's a big division in race. In other regions, it's on the same. So I, I would argue that the division in race is probably common among the rural South. In other regions, the division may be more economic class. So, for example, in the Northeast, maybe more economic class divides. In the South or Southeast, especially in our state, maybe more racial, race, race, ethnicity divides. 
And there's communities where some groups of people are supposed to, are perceived as having inferior cultures, which does not help. So I'm going to skip over. We had an article on lynching. I'm going to, I wish I hate to cut. I'm going to, I'm going to um, skip over. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I would say if, um, if that could be kind of one of your last major topics, and then we can get some questions in. Yes. I, let me get my last, let me get my wrap up slide then. Sorry. Perfect. Yes. All right. So get excited. I kind of want to hear there. about the lynching now. <laughs> yeah, we had a great article on lynching and health disparities. Basically, my short takeaway is Dr. Pope, Dr. Glover, and I wrote an article on lynching and health disparities. And essentially, areas where there was a history of lynching or high rates of lynching, there is greater health disparities now. So showing that the structural racism and structural discrimination has health effects now, even now, which I'm sure you're not surprised to hear about, but it is wow, interesting yeah. to see it in um, real time data, right? where lynchings were and where what the health effects are now. Okay, chief use of health disparities and why these occur in rural areas, I'm gonna stop talking. So Vance, this are, one author says, hillbillies have a horrible culture, it's a cultural problem. I disagree with Vance, that's a hillbilly LG, LG article. L hillbilly LG it was so popular a couple years ago. Duncan says, who's another sociologist, says, okay, he has this was great book called Worlds Apart. Divided society, she argues that divided societies do not equip lower class residents with the tools needed to navigate successfully in a world structure around upper class needs and tastes. And I would agree with Duncan that we're just not equipping people with education, um, et cetera, in order to be able to improve their life course and improve health disparities. Okay, I'm gonna end with questions. I'm sorry I ran over, I got pumped and kept going. That's okay. So I appreciate the perspective um, that you said kind of trying to bring your whole class to us in one session. So I guess if you had to sum up some takeaways, what might those be? And then I do want to, um, you did highlight some of your thoughts about COVID-19. So I wonder if you could elaborate on some of that a bit. So kind of what would be your major takeaway? So these are students who presumably have never been introduced to rural health disparities before, but what might be some of the takeaways? And then if, if like a preview to your class, if you will. Yeah, so some takeaways would be um, mortality rates higher, um, you know, so maybe incidence rates of these diseases are not higher, but the mortality rates are higher. And these are due to multiple behavioral issues, um, access issues, provider shortage issues, et cetera. But there is a benefit and there is a positive side to illustrating these, meaning that we are now seeing more policy interventions, for example, that have some of these health interventions and health structural things that I saw. What's happened with COVID-19 is there has been the National Rural Health Association, which I'm, I'm the research education chair for that. I'm on the board of trustees for the National Health Association. They have done a fantastic job of getting some of this information out where we have seen some um, advanced funding to critical access hospitals. For example, critical access hospitals received extra fine during COVID-19. They also, but they also had some legislation changes from COVID-19. So for example, critical access hospitals are usually only able to see patients for 96 hours and move into a larger facility. The COVID-19 legislation changed this and said, okay, we can now see patients longer and keep patients longer. So rural health clinics, same deal, are changing some of these um, limits about how they fund them during COVID-19 so they can see patients for longer and pay more patients if they're uninsured which will help these rural providers that are already at capacity and under, um, sadly underfunded to help with more of their funding problems. So they can stay open. One of the one of the scary parts of this COVID-19 crisis is will it force more rural providers to go out of business because they just simply cannot afford to see so many uninsured patients. Mm -hmm. And so I do think there's been some rapid response and rapid legislation that's happened because of the push of National Rural Health Association and how we help rural um, hospitals and facilities. Mm -hmm. All right, class, any questions that you may have for Dr. Crouch? I don't know if y'all saw the chat box, but I highlighted social determinants of health. I wish, I, I want to say drinking game, but I don't want to say drinking game. It was like every time we had a guest speaker who said social determinants of health, it's like I didn't prime them, but certainly that ends up being the underlying cause of the disparities that we see. Um, so any questions? Exactly. Crouch. 
Elizabeth, any thoughts about, so I, I love this slide about kind of the South Carolina plan. Um, what are your thoughts about addressing disparities broadly? What are some things that we should be focusing on in public health as it relates to how we address disparities moving forward? Um, I think taking into consideration the, the like, for example, even the, from the community talks they had with South Carolina World Action Plan, one of the biggest talks was um, racism and divisions around race. So, you know, part of this is just, part of this is like communities overcoming that through, I mean, it, gathering and education, you know, like the lack, you know, helping with schools, like let's do more to make sure their schools are not as segregated like they are in the Southeast. That's one of the kind of the biggest places I would think to start is really starting the edge social determinant of health education, but also not just, not just trying to educate at higher rates in rural America, but how do you do so where you're bringing everyone to the table and making it, making the, um, making the education everyone receives equitable. Yeah, and so class, that's part of the theories of disparities lecture that you guys have access to from last week. So the recorded lecture that I have for you posted. Dr. Ingram, I love this all coming full circle and I didn't even it know is. you all had any of that. It is, I know. And, and further evidence that we need to go ahead and get that paper out. We keep saying whenever we meet, we need to work on something. So yes, we do. I mean, it's amazing how, you know, parallel these worlds really are. And so for you guys as students, I hope you also get to see the recurrent themes that also helps to weave in what you're learning Certainly if you're in public health, you know, as public health is a minor or even have an interest in going to focus on public, public health beyond this class, um, all of the things that we talk are intimately intertwined. And Dr. Crouch kind of coming from a policy perspective, you still see some of the same language and terminology that we've talked about all throughout the semester. So it all makes sense. So thanks again, Dr. Crouch. Um, of course. Thank you all very much for having me.